prisoners were sentenced to death. One of them French, one of them German, one of them from Belgium. What is your last wish? They ask the French guy. He says, a bottle of exquisite French wine. What is your last wish? They ask the German guy. He says, I want to give a speech. <laughs> What is your last wish? They ask the guy from Belgium. He says, I want to get shot before the German starts his speech. <laughs> Unfortunately for you guys, it is too late now. <laughs> My speech will be about the most important, about the grand theme of the 21st century, which is the rise of artificial intelligence, which is going to transform every aspect of our civilization. And before we, um, we look at the current century, let's have a brief look at the previous century. What was the most important thing in the previous century? The journal Nature in 1999 made a list of the most influential inventions of the 20th century. And number one, of course, was the invention from 1908, which made the 20th century stand out among all centuries ever in the history of mankind, because it was the one that drove the population explosion from 1.6 billion people in the year 1900 to soon 10 billion. It's a chemical thing. Under high pressure and high temperature, nitrogen is extracted from thin air to make still 500 million tons of artificial fertilizer per year. Now, without that stuff, half of humankind would not even exist. This planet could sustain at most four billion people without that one invention. Billions and billions and billions would never have lived without it. And soon, two out of three people on this planet will depend on this one single invention. Nothing else was remotely as influential as that. However, the AI explosion of the present century is going to be much more impactful and grander than that. Because there we are not talking about small numbers such as four or ten, but we are talking about trillions of trillions. And this has a lot to do with the fact that computers are getting faster by a factor of ten per euro per five years. And this trend has held at least since 1941, when Konrad Zuse built the first working program-controlled computer in 1941, 75 years ago. Every five years since then, computers became roughly 10 times cheaper, which means that now we have a factor of a million billions. And this trend has been running for a long time, But only recently, we have approached the computational power of a small animal brain. And in the near future, for the first time, for a thousand euros, we will have small computers which can compute as much as a human brain. And then, if the trend doesn't break, and there's no reason why it should break, it will take another 25 years, and we will have um, It will take another 50 years, and we will have a small device for the same price, which can compute as much as all 10 billion brains combined, as all brains of humankind together. And there will not be only one of these devices, but many, many, many. We won't program these computers like we do with the current computers. We are going to train them. We are going to educate them like we educate babies and kids. And one of the techniques that recently has become rebranded under the name deep learning, which is just a rebranding of an, of an old hat, is this uh, technique called artificial neural networks. Has anybody ever heard about artificial neural networks? Mm -hmm. Has anybody not ever heard of artificial neural networks? Okay. We have a third group in this room. 
probably already asleep. <laughs> Deep learning goes back at least 50 years because, and, and much of that, and this is a good place, this is in the middle of Europe, and it's a good place to point out that most of this research, many of the basic insights, come from Europe. This started 50 years ago in the Ukraine, where a mathematician called Ivaknenko built the first really deep neural networks, artificial networks, that could learn from experience. And we have made a lot of progress since then. This renaissance that you'd see down there is not um, a typo. It's really an RNN naissance because that stands for recurrent neural networks, which are the deepest of them all. The recurrent neural networks are the deepest and most powerful artificial networks. And they are inspired a little bit by the human brain. The human brain, your brain, has in your cortex about 10 billion little processors, which are called neurons. And each of them is connected to, on average, 10,000 other neurons which means you have got a hundred thousand billion connections in your brain. In the beginning, these, most of these connections are apparently randomly pre-wired. But through learning, through experience, through trial and error, they change. And each connection strength indicates how much does this neuron influence this neuron over there. And here we see a simple recurrent network, an artificial recurrent network, which also has input units, like, for example, your retina or a camera where pixels are streaming into the system, or acoustic sounds or whatever, or pain signals or pleasure signals are streaming to this little artificial brain and their output nodes, which produce actions, action sequences, control robot mu muscles or control your muscles in your case. And in between, thinking takes place in these hidden neurons. And the art of my profession is to come up with a learning algorithm that changes these connections such that the initially dumb network over time learns to solve problems that it couldn't solve before, just like your kids do and like you did. And, and one of the best methods um, that is now widely used is called long short-term memory. Long short-term memory is a method that we have developed in our labs in Munich and in Switzerland through European tax money since, <laughs> since the beginning of the 90s. And uh, they are much better than previous networks, able to learn to deal with deep problems where you have to memorize things for a long time. And, uh, and, and long short-term memory back then was just a curiosity, but today it's widely used by the world's most valuable companies, such as Google and Apple and so on, which makes us happy. And some people ask me, do you have a demo? And I just have to ask, do you have a smartphone? Because you have a little piece of us in your pocket. Whenever you take out your smartphone and you don't want to type into it, but instead you press on the little microphone there in the Google Voice icon, then you can speak to it. And, and the Google Voice speech recognition is based now on our long short-term memory, which was developed uh, since, the, yeah, since the early 90s with the first author back then, uh, Sepp Hochreiter, my first student ever, then Felix Geers, Alex Graves, and a couple of other great students in my lab. And it reached the current form more or less in the year 2006. That's what's now on your smartphone. So and basically, basically, it's 10-year-old technology. And, um, and this thing has learned from experience to recognize speech. So how does that, did that work? Lots of people spoke. And then in these training examples, there was a teacher who knew what they meant. So in comes speech signals, which is every 10 milliseconds, another number vector coming from the microphone, so you get 100 inputs per, per second, and then these go in through these input units and they circle around along these recurrent connections in the network, and later uh, the network is supposed to generate a sequence of letters, which correspond to the uh, recognized speech. And until 2015, this didn't work well, and Google had another system for doing the speech recognition, and it was really annoying. But then uh, they replaced it by long short-term memory, and since then, um, speech recognition is not only 5% better or 10%, which would have been great, but almost 
And now even in a noisy restaurant, you can talk to it and it can recognize what you're saying. Now this LSTM is so universal and powerful, you can also use it to translate from one language into the other. For example, you give it lots of, here we are in, in Brussels, so you give it lots of uh, examples of texts from, uh, from the European Parliament, which is written in English, and then uh, translation in French. In the beginning, the network is totally stupid and knows nothing about English. It knows nothing about French. Then it sees lots of examples of English sentences being fed in, and we force it to output the corresponding translations in French. In between, the network is randomly pre wired It has no idea what to do. However, through a learning algorithm, all these connections change their strengths such that after a long period of training, the thing has discovered the rules of English, the syntactic rules of English, the structure of French, and how to go from the meaning in English to the meaning in French. And the best system currently for translating automatically from one language to the other is based on this LSTM. And we have greatly profited, of course, from the fact that every 10 years we are gaining a factor of 100. When we started that, computers were a million times lower than today for the same price. Now they are a million times faster, and that makes a big difference. Other networks of ours, uh, um, feed-forward networks that you can use for computer vision, in 2011, for the first time, were able to achieve even superhuman performance when it came to pattern recognition. Pattern recognition is something that kids are doing very well, and it's much harder than playing chess. How do I know that? Because 20 years ago, in the year 1997, the best chess player on this planet was not a human anymore. It was a machine. However, back then, no computer was able to recognize patterns such as glasses or traffic signs or microphones or faces as well as humans do. But then in 2011, in a traffic sign recognition competition, for the first time, we had a superhuman performance there and three times better than the nearest uh, competitor. So, uh, this shows that we are slowly creeping in there um, into that level of human performance in more and more domains. And remember, every 10 years we are getting a factor of 100. At the moment it's scaling linearly. And soon we will have rather big networks which can um, not only achieve one superhuman performance on a particular task, task, but on many, many different tasks. We can apply the same techniques to uh, medical imaging. This is a brain image, let me skip that. Uh, for example, what you see here is a slice through a female breast. And you see all these little cells there in this microscopic image. And some of them are good cells and some of them are dangerous. They are in the pre-cancer stage, mitosis cells as they are called. Normally, you need a trained doctor, a histologist, who looks at these images and then um, says for each of these little details there, that's a good one, that's a bad one, that's a bad one. I'm not a doctor, but we can train our artificial neural networks on lots of data to achieve a performance, a recognition performance, which is comparable to the one of human doctors. That's how in 2012, for the first time, we were able to win pattern recognition competitions in that really, really important domain. So, this type of AI, a little a small type of AI, is already good enough to replace certain things that doctors are good at. It doesn't mean that doctors are going to be um, abolished, not at all. It just means that the same guy, the same doctor, will be able to treat 10 times as many patients in the same time with high quality. And we'll have more time for the thing which is often neglected today, which is, uh, which is doctor-patient discussions and stuff like that. This is super important because the world GDP is about 70 trillion. Is it already 80 trillion? I'm not sure. And 10% of that is for healthcare, which is about 7 trillion. And at least 10% of that per year is just for medical diagnosis like that, which is 700 billion per year. But apart from the numbers in finance and economy, what's much more important is that lots of people who at the moment don't have any significant access to healthcare at all through artificial doctors like that are going to have decent health care. We were able to win additional competitions along these lines. Here's a thing that Google is doing with our LSTM combined with a technique called uh, convolutional networks. There, you, in the lower left corner, you see an image where, where you see a text below the image. The text says, a herd of elephants walking across a dry grass field. 
and you look at the image, yes, it's true. And the interesting thing is, this was automatically generated. So there was a, um, an LSTM network combined with another feedforward network, which has learned from many, many training examples of images and captions to recognize what is in the image and then give a short summary in an English um, paragraph what you can see there. No teacher. Just uh, from lots of training examples like that. Sometimes it goes bad. For example, the second, the second image in the top row says um, two dogs play in the grass. And you look at it and it's actually three dogs. But it's not complete, completely wrong. Before I came here, I thought this is going to be just a little tech talk and there won't be much of an audience, but you are actually a large audience by my standards. <laughs> the other day I gave a talk and there was just a single person in the audience. <laughs> it was a young lady. I said, young lady, it's very embarrassing, but apparently today I'm going to give this talk just to you. And she said, um, okay, um, please hurry. Uh, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> recently, um, recently, Google DeepMind made a program that became the best Go player in the world. And it wasn't pre-programmed, it learned that from um, lots of games playing against itself. It's not a totally new thing. Um, in 1994 already, a backgammon program learned to become the best backgammon player in the world by playing against itself, using very similar principles. However, Go is more complex than backgammon, and a couple of additional tricks were employed there, and it received a lot of attention. These are neural networks which learn over time to become better Go players. And I'm proud of that because uh, DeepMind is a company which didn't even exist five years ago and then um, in 2014 was bought by Google and they were heavily influenced by my students. Um, actually, the first two guys at DeepMind who are doing what DeepMind is doing, which is artificial intelligence and, and machine learning, they were both uh, students in my lab where they met and they were the first at DeepMind who had really PhDs in that field. Uh, then later they hired a couple of additional guys uh, from my lab. So um, this shows that there is now a lot of commercial interest in, in this stuff and Google and many communication companies are massively using artificial intelligence or at least these artificial neural networks all the time to place better ads whenever you are searching for something. So these are marketing companies communication companies, and they have taken, I think, half of the advertising business of the world, Google and Facebook, which is using similar techniques, by just being better able to tailor ads by looking at what kind of data can I get from these users, such that I can increase the probability that they will click at these ads. So the techniques that I've mentioned so far can be used for things like that, and are part of the money-making machine behind these search engines. What we will see in the near future are extensions of stuff that we did, um, maybe already also 10 years ago, where you also can control robots. Um, 2006, we had LSTM networks that learned to control uh, surgery robots like that, um, to tie knots into, in, in very confined settings and artificial pigs in this uh, example no real pigs harmed. Some people think that creativity and curiosity are something that will always uh, remain a domain of humans, but this is not true. And we have a formal theory of fun and curiosity and, uh, and, and creativity, which allows us to already um, build simple artificial scientists and artists. And here we have a little um, robot, a baby robot, which in the beginning knew nothing, but then over time learned through experiments to, uh, to interact with the world. Usually what you have in systems like that is two systems. One is the neural network, which is interacting with the world, and then there's another one, its friend, you, you, you might say, which learns to predict what happens if I do that and that. What happens if I do that and that? And then this prediction machine in, in, 
in the beginning knows nothing, but over time, like a baby, it learns how work, the gravity works, how do the apples fall to the ground if I push them from the table, and so on and so on. So it learns to become a better and better predictor of what's going to happen if I do that and that. And then um, we can measure the insights of this second module of this world model, if you will, we can measure the depth of these insights as it learns something that it didn't know, and that's a number. And we give that to the first guy who is creating the experiments that lead to the data that has the property that the world model can become better. And now the first guy is motivated to maximize its all these rewards, all these curiosity rewards, these intrinsic joy signals, which motivate it to come up with additional experiments that tell it even uh, more about how the world works. So, artificial scientists, in a certain sense, that we already have had running for a couple of times, for, for a couple of years. How much more do I have? Not so many additional minutes left, however, let me, let me um, again point out that we are currently greatly profiting from the fact that every five years we are gaining a factor of 10. Now we have 75 years after Zuse, which means we have now um, we have now LSTM networks, long short-term memory networks of the type that we developed in Switzerland and in Munich with about a billion connections. Your brains have about 100,000 billion connections. 100,000 means 25 years, because it's 5 to the 10, which means we have to meet, wait for 25 more years, and for the same price, we will for the first time have LSTM networks that have the size of a human brain. And they will be much faster than human brains, because they have um, electronic connections, not uh, the slow connections that we have. Things are going to change very soon. Many people don't realize how quickly this is now moving forward. What will be the next thing? I think in the not so distant future, we will have something, we don't have that yet, which is like a little animal-like intelligence, like a little monkey. Little monkeys at the moment can do many, many things that our best robots cannot do at all, can learn lots of things that um, Machines cannot yet learn. However, we think we understand how to get there, and within not so many years, we will have little artificial intelligences on the level of a, of a simple, of a small animal, like a crow or a monkey, capuchin monkey. And once we have that, the, the step towards human-level intelligence won't be that huge, because look at evolution. It took billions of years to come up with a little monkey, but then only a few millions or tens of millions of years to add human-level intelligence on top of that. Because technological evolution is a million times faster than biological evolution, because the dead ends are weeded out much faster. So, it, to me, it would be super surprising if within a decade, in, within a few decades, we won't have um, human-level intelligence of the artificial kind. I don't want to deny that we have a company, not only the academic lab, but also a company which is called Nasens, which is trying to make that a reality. Nasens is pronounced like birth, Nasens, but it's spelled in a different way, NN for neural networks, AI for artificial intelligence. What will be the far future? Of course, once AIs are going to be smarter than humans, and it, there is no doubt in my mind that this will come within the century, what will they do? They will not stick to this thin film of biosphere around the third planet, because almost all resources in the solar system are out there in space. Less than one billionth of the solar energy is hitting our planet, and the rest at the moment is wasted. It's not going to stay like that. And they will move out there and they will build billions and billions of self-replicating robot factories in the asteroid belt and spread from there in a way that is completely impossible, physically impossible for humans. Space is hostile to human, humans, but it's really friendly to appropriately designed robots. And they are going to spread slowly out through the Milky Way and within a couple of millions of years, completely within the limits of physics and light speed and so on, they will establish a network of senders and receivers all over the galaxy. 
And of course, from then on, they will, AIs will travel the way AIs always have traveled, namely by light speed, by radio, from senders to receivers, in a way completely infeasible for humans. We are currently witnessing the beginning of something that is huge. This is not just another industrial revolution. This is more than all of civilization. This is a step, a new step on the path of the universe towards higher and higher complexity. And the last time we had a step of that significance, I think, was about 3.5 billion years ago with the invention of life. So this goes beyond humankind. This transcends humankind. And, uh, and it's a privilege to be part of that and witness the beginnings of that. With that, Final thought, I would like to um, point out that we shouldn't think of us versus them, us humans versus those super uber robots of the future, but view all of us, including humankind and civilization and these future beings as part of one grand scheme that allows the universe to go from, small from, from simple states towards more complex states. And it's, it's great to be a part of that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Some exciting predictions for true artificial intelligence coming at us within our own lifetime is basically what you're telling us. We're going to say, I mean, true, just run it by us again. What classifies true in that def definition as opposed to what we can already see happening yeah. around us today? What can we already see when you're talking to your smartphone? Then it's mostly pure pattern recognition. Your smartphone doesn't have arms. It doesn't shape the world. It can influence you by giving you advice such that, for example, it says, um, now you are in this foreign city and you can, um, and I know there is a second-hand shop not far from here, which is of the type you like and they have a special thing on offer and you go there uh, because that's a good deal for you. But um, they don't have robot arms and at the moment what we see is that robotics and mechanics are lagging behind what we can do in pattern recognition. It's not going to stay like that, so I think within the next years and, and few decades, small number of decades, we will see very sophisticated robots that will be able to solve all kinds of problems that humans um, at the moment um, have to solve by themselves, including strawberry plucking, which is much harder than most people think, simply because there is no really good strawberry plucking robot. It's not going to stay like that. And then, of course, um, uh, AI in general is really not just pattern recognition, but interaction with the world. So you, you act, you perceive, you act, you perceive, you get a stream of um, inputs, data that you're shaping yourself on your way to solving goals, because all of AI is about problem solving. And this is currently becoming a reality, although most commercial stuff is just pattern recognition, just better speech recognition, better gesture recognition, better prediction of uh, the stock market, another thing that our company is um, pretty good at, and, um, and um, uh, better prediction of what you want to do next, uh, given the data that you have on your smartphone. I'm just going to pick up on that point of strawberry plucking or picking um, <laughs> simply because that uh, leads to the question, obviously there are lots of concerns about the uh, implications of artificial intelligence for employment, for instance. We've already seen robot journalism happening just this week, um, or, or last week it was perhaps. How worried should we be that those of us who are involved in, in uh, wordy kinds of, uh, kinds of professions are, are simply going to be replaced? I mean, many professions, obviously, strawberry plucking being amongst them. Yeah, um, so in the 80s, I already said always, um, it is very easy to predict which jobs are going to go like taxi driver and stuff like that. It's very hard to predict all the new jobs which are being created all the time. And there's this playing man thing, homo ludens. Homo ludens, the playing man, is inventing new professions all the time. And most of these professions are really luxury professions. Um, for example, although the best chess players in the world are not humans anymore, you have still humans making money by ch playing chess against each other. Or user in Bolt 
is much slower than the fastest machines, but he is still making hundreds of millions just uh, by running against other humans. And uh, all these new uh, types of interactions with other people that you see on social networks, bloggers, YouTubers, and so on, who could have predicted that 20 years ago? So uh, if you look at the unemployment rates today, they are pretty much the same that we had back then. Mm -hmm. So adaptation is obviously the secret there. Yeah. And uh, like Matt Peacock said earlier, in the earlier session, if your kids are wondering what they should do, they should become data analysts, uh, amongst other things. Questions from the floor for Jürgen Schmidt-Huber. Yeah. We have one over here. Let's get you a microphone. Thank you. Um, I was interested by the comparison you made about parenting and teaching machines to, uh, as you would teach a child. Um, and I recall when I first became a parent, everyone said, well, you know, there's no manual for it, you need to figure it out. And um, I realized very quickly that it's not that easy, and some people do it better than others. So using that comparison, how do you sort of respond to the future that you've set out? Yeah. So you are worried that some um, parents are going to teach them the wrong things. For example, in military applications, where some of those guys will be taught to do military jobs, where, for example, self-driving cars are going to be used as self-driving land mine seekers, which, of course, every general will want because he wants to protect the soldiers and so on. And so you're worried about educating them to do things that are detrimental, at least, to the lives of certain people. However, on the other hand, it is clear that almost all of the commercial research in this field is driven towards making AIs, artificial neural networks, that learn to help humans, to make humans happier, such as a smarter friend in your pocket, your smartphone, which is even better at understanding you and talking back to you and, and giving you advice and so on. Or in healthcare, where people will just live longer because of this partially automated healthcare that we are going to see. So, am I correct that you are worried about the relation between, on the one hand, these military applications as opposed to these much uh, larger and much more valuable um, commercial and healthcare-oriented applications? Well, not quite, actually. What I'm worried about is the fact that as a parent, again, I do the best I can raising my children. But there are things that I might do at the age of five that might have an implication for when they're 10, 15, for the choices they make. So, sure, there are lots of people who aren't, who, there are lots of effort to do the right things. But actually, you know, take the comparison of a smartphone. Certain people now, we talk about having digital detox weekends or whatever it might be, because we realize that there are consequences that only become apparent later on. And it, technology is a fantastic thing, but there are con these consequences, and that's really what I'm getting at, because you're taking sort of science and you're going into a realm where, like you say, it's an unpredictable thing like parenting. Yes, but I'm not the first uh, on this path. It reminds me a little bit of the discussion that we had um, 600,000 years ago when fire was invented. And, and back then, an ethics committee was established, which, um, which, um, which uh, weighed the pros and cons. And some people said, yeah, it's going to keep us warm at night. But the others said, but you can also use it to burn people. And then, at some point, um, the commission came to a conclusion, and they said, um, we are not going to stop that development, because we can't even stop it. And uh, let's move forward. And I think we see the same thing happening now. There was a, uh, thank you very much for, the, for those questions. Certainly uh, interesting Hi. analog. Hello, um, thank you for your talk. Um, we hear a lot about uh, trust in society and we hear about society splitting in two. Um, and basically, apart from the discussion on artificial intelligence, intelligence per se is not equally distributed in society. Um, do you think that rich, well-educated people are replacing the other half with robots? And would the robots have voted for Brexit? <laughs> so 
So in, in my profession, it's not unusual that people uh, like the idea of uh, unconditioned base salary, which recently we had as a discussion in Switzerland. So I'm not Swiss, but I'm living there, and so um, I see what's going on. So I think almost, was it a third or something? A third of the population would support, uh, support that idea, and I think in a couple of tens of years, we will have many more. So many people in, in this profession of building machines that become smarter over time think it's a good idea to have robots pay taxes and to have robot owners pay taxes. And of course, society will have to come up with systems like that with a social response to the technological advances. And it will happen as it always happened, otherwise we will get a revolution. Thanks for that question. We have another question over here in the second row. Yes, Professor, um, you made a clear calculation in the beginning about uh, how much time it would take until this or that happened. Okay. Um, now my question is, if you extend that uh, calculation, how long will it take until the robots will definitely take over the Earth? Yeah, will they really take over the Earth? That is um, a very debatable uh, scene inspired by Arnold Schwarzenegger movies and <laughs> And it has not so much to do with reality, because, see, you are being taken over or you are being enslaved only by others who are like yourself, who have similar goals and share the same goals. <coughs> so that's why humans usually quarrel with other humans, but not so much with, um, with um, um, kangaroos. And, uh, <laughs> and it, it, it's the case that Almost all people are interested in other people who are similar to themselves because either they can collaborate with them or um, compete with them, or sometimes both. And when one nation or one company competes against another company, each of them being a collection of humans. And, um, and, and the fundamental condition for that is that you share goals because you are similar. Now, the super smart AIs of the future will not be so interested in humans, just like humans are not so interested in the ants. The super smart AIs of the future will mostly be interested in other super smart AIs of the future, simply because those will be much more interesting and share similar goals in an environment which may be quite disconnected from what we have here in this little biosphere. We are much smarter than the ants, aren't we? But um, only when they invade our houses, we take measures against them. But most of the ants in the world, they are happily living in the forests, and we are glad they are doing that. And the weight of all ants is still comparable to the weight of all humans, simply because we don't have too many gold conflicts with each other. And that's going to be the same thing with the super smart robots. We have time. I'm going, to, I'm going to make allowances for one more question here in the front. Yes. Um, because then we're going to have to... Uh, a very short follow-up. You were mentioning a movie. Uh -huh. I mentioned another one, 2001, um, Space Odyssey. The, 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 um, all is not against the human. He just has his logic. He has a mission to follow. And uh, man is on his way. So he has different goals. He thinks differently than a human but it still becomes a danger. And if uh, artificial in, uh, intelli intelligence says, for instance, there are about two million too many people, so the logical step will be to kill, for instance, two billion people to make sure that the seven other people, billion, can survive. That would, for instance, a different kind of logic than a human logic. So I don't know if it's that clear that the machine will not be a problem. So what you're saying sounds more like human logic to me rather than machine logic. And we do have people or in the history of mankind, there have been people who um, had ideas like that. Let's kill all the others that, such that just we remain and then we are the chiefs. But again, it's always about similar guys against other similar guys because they share the same goals. If you don't share the same goals, then there is no interest in fighting. Uh, for example, wh where do the fights of the past come from? Because this country has something that this country also wants, like oil or uh, land or whatever. And, um, and, and then there are these uh, fights. But um, generally speaking, 
as soon as you have disconnected lives and goals of a different, very different type, which you can expect from future super smart AIs, then you don't have to worry too much about the things that you see in, scientific, in science fiction novels, for example. And, and some, some of you may have seen the film Matrix. Matrix <laughs> has a silly plot. It has great computer graphics and the codes are great, the black codes are great. But, but the plot is the silliest plot ever. So there, the AIs of the future, they live off the energy of the human brain. <laughs> So each, of, each brain produces maybe 30 watts of energy, and the coal power plant that you need to keep the human alive um, produces much more energy than that. So all of these plots are silly goal conflicts invented by film producers who just wanted to have a clash between robots and, and, um, and, machine, and, and <laughs> robots and, and humans. And um, it's all very unrealistic. It um, seems clear that this is not the future. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jürgen Schmidhuber. I'm going to have to stop it there. The bad news is we're stopping it now, but the good news is that Jürgen Schmidhuber has decided to stay with us and I believe also attend the evening festivities. So he'll also be around here in the ensuing moments after this session for some one-on-one -on -one questioning. Please give him a hand. Thank you very much. Thank you.